All right, time for chapter three, the second chapter we're doing as part of the lecture series. And this chapter is on the energetics of life, which is a really fancy way to say that what we're going to discuss today is the chemical rationale for biological action. So this is actually something I usually discuss with my class right out the gate, is there's a lot of different perspectives on how to teach biochemistry. Uh, there's actually three major categories. You can approach biochemistry from a biological perspective, and most people with biology intensive backgrounds do that. You can also approach it from a phar pharmaceutical perspective, which is really common in medical programs, dental programs, where they're really trying to tie all of the pathways and events to specific checkpoints in the physiology and how drugs interact with those checkpoints. And then you can do it also the way I tend to approach it, which is from a chemical perspective. And it's because my classic training preceding my PhD was chemistry. So I typically view the study of biochemistry as a detailed study of how chemical interactions drive biological events. And this is a really important chapter for that because we're going to look at energy and we're going to look at how different variables in physiology can be used to our advantage as organisms to yield efficient chemical reactions and or establish biological control over those reactions. Okay, so we have to start out right out the gate with a little bit of thermodynamics um, and then we'll get into a lot of what is ultimately applied Chem 106 review. So this chapter should have a lot of familiar content because it's a capstone course. We're going to refer to some physics concepts and a lot of gen chem concepts, and we're going to be applying them to biological systems, which is going to give them a bit of a new twist. But even though a lot of this should be familiar, if you need more depth on these topics, I recommend picking up those gen chem books and digging in a little deeper if you need a little bit more um, freshening up on some of these topics. So when we're talking about systems, what defines a thermodynamic system is somewhat arbitrary in the technical definitions. Uh, there are closed systems which can exchange energy but not matter with surroundings. You have open systems which can exchange matter and energy with their surroundings and then you have isolated systems which can either exchange matter nor energy with their surroundings. And how you define your system really determines your ability to evaluate energy in, energy out, heat in, heat out, matter in, matter out as part of exchange. Now when you're talking about a cell, obviously it's not closed. There's exchange into and out of the cell from the rest of the tissue and organism. When you're talking about the organism, same case in point. It's not, it's not closed. There's an input of energy, an output of energy, consumption and modifications of energy, and we're also exchanging mass through respiration and various other means. So when we're discussing the thermodynamics, you always have to be very careful about establishing what your system is and what the model is to which you're referring. Now, one of the caveats that this book likes to lay down is that living systems typically operate at near constant temperatures and pressures. Now, there's some obvious modifications to that. If you're talking about a cold-blooded animal, there's going to be some drift in their temperature. That is technically a biological disadvantage because they have a limited range for ideal operation. But they're also establishing the ability of operating without investing the energy to control their own temperature. So there's a trade-off there. So yes, the book says at constant temperature pressure, we'll say close to constant temperature pressure to be a little bit more true to, uh, to form here. So let's review some of the laws, basic laws of thermodynamics and enthalpy. That's what we're going to be talking about a lot about enthalpy and Gibbs free energy and entropy actually moving forward. So the first law of thermodynamics is energy is always conserved. It's neither created nor destroyed. It's just modified in its form. So in a closed system, energy can be exchanged with the surroundings via either work or heat. So a biological slash chemical event can produce work, 
or heat, which is a way that our energy is utilized. Now, enthalpy, or H, and we often refer to it as delta H because we're evaluating changes to enthalpy within a system, is in terms of biochemistry, specifically if you go to a physicist, they'll give you a slightly different answer. But for biochemical applications, because of our near constant temperature, near constant pressure systems, particularly the constant pressure approximation, is heat exchanged between the system and the surroundings at a constant pressure. So we can basically think of enthalpy as heat. Even though we can calculate heat separately as small q, when you think enthalpy, think about heat or thermodynamics associated with heat. And here's a nice example of measuring uh, heat of a reaction or slash enthalpy. So we have this really cool uh, little diagram, which is strain pretty far from the biochemical model um, in every way except that it's using the uh, calculation of heat in a system. And so this is your classic bomb calorimeter and you, except this isn't a true cal bomb calorimeter because you're having a change of, of volume in your reaction, but you can see that we have a solid, whoa, I did it again, let me move over to pens and let me grab a pen so I can do that without dragging around. So here we have a fatty acid, and that's what the system is going to be combusting. So we've got, uh, let's see, 15, 16 carbons and a carboxylic acid functionality, and we're going to combust that with 23 equivalents of oxygen gas, and under perfect combustion conditions, that will yield 16 equivalents of carbon dioxide gas and 16 equivalents of water. And so it's even nice, they even label it palmitic acid, that's your 16 carbon basic fatty acid. So initially, if you have one mole of palmitic acid and you combust it in what would probably be actually excess oxygen in a functional uh, thermodynamic experiment, but we'll just go with the 23 equivalents of oxygen. Um, in a system with a moving piston, under constant pressure, in this case, one bar exhibited, you can work, exert a change of temperature and exert work on the system. So what you're seeing here through Q, reflected by the thermometer going up, is that we have a change in temperature where the combustion exerts heat on its surroundings. And we also see, because of a change of volume, and we know that there's an equivalency of volume to work being done on a system, because we started about here with the piston initially, we've expanded the chamber under pressure, which is exerting a work on the system. So this is just just to refresh everybody's memory on what delta H means and the two things that it can do for us biologically. So the book uses some terms interestingly that I'd like to kind of work through and clarify. You got reversible and irreversible processes. And from I had to explain my perspective on biochemistry initially because this is going to be me going down the chemical path a little bit more than the biological path. In Chem 105, we do a lot of talking about reversible and irreversible reactions, reactive and non-reactive, soluble and insoluble. And then in Chem 106, we add a shade of gray to all of that. And we dis discover that nearly all reactions can be described as reversible to some extent, or conversely irreversible to some extent. Now that doesn't mean that they don't predominantly tend towards one end of the spectrum or another, but to say that one is just absolutely reversible or irreversible is a little scientifically disingenuous. So I like to um, use these terms a little tongue-in-cheek, and when I do use them it's mostly in reference to what the book is saying, but always keep in mind that um, Reversibility and irreversibility of reactive uh, reactions are um, part of a spectrum and, and not absolutes. So 
what the book does say here, which is interesting, a reversible process, and you don't hear it explained this way too often, a reversible process is near a state of equilibrium. So that is not incorrect. However, you don't typically think of it like that. Now, if you have a um, reaction which is tending, let's just talk about a generic reaction here. Um, ooh, let me pick up a pen again. A plus B is in equilibrium going to C plus D. If you have a reaction that's in equilibrium, and like I said before, most reactions are in some sense of equilibrium, if a reaction is highly biased, so we'll just kind of push it towards products in this case, the book would say, oh, let me see if it'll will take. If the reaction is highly biased towards products, the book would say that this is no longer near equilibrium. Um, however, obviously, equilibrium is established whether it's towards products or reactants. It's still an equilibrium process. So I think what the book is trying to get to here is when you have uh, a system which does not highly favor either the products or highly favor your reactants and you have a more balanced picture of equilibrium whether it's favoring one or the other slightly those systems are subject to being pushed one direction or the other via a variety of forces um, which we can think of in terms of Le Chatelet's principle or just reaction conditions and and I believe that's what the book is trying to get to here. So when it says a reversible process is near state of equilibrium, what it's really saying is that when a system is in a state of equilibrium which doesn't dramatically favor either reactants or products, is when it takes relatively little energy to coax it one way or the other a little bit. Um, and that is a really nice perspective biochemically because what it does is it lets us think about how we regulate systems biologically. Uh, one of the cruxes of biology is that most of our large chemical structures, tertiary and quaternary level organizations, are just, just barely stable. They're stable enough to function, but they're not so stable that we can't tweak them chemically to regulate them. So we want something that functions, but we also want something that we can alter the function of with relatively little chemical investment or energetic investment. And, and that's really this. And I believe that's what the book's trying to get to. So irreversible processes, uh, on the other hand, as the book defines them, are processes that are set up far from an equilibrium state and then proceed towards that state. So their example in this case is burning paper versus the melting ice example. Um, yes, technically, if you have an irreversible process like burning paper where you have some substrate and you oxidize it and it's consumed carbon dioxide and water through via perfect combustion, that is an irreversible reaction for all intents and purposes um, because the amount of energy it would take to reform uh, everything uh, from scratch. But it's also um, just an equilibrium process that is pushed very, very, very close towards completion. And we also don't have perfect combustion processes either. So it's a little bit of a simplification, but we're going to work with it for the context of this book. Okay, so next slide. So the next law of thermodynamics is entropy. So the second law of thermodynamics, uh, the entropy of an isolated system will tend to increase to a maximum value, meaning that energy will tend towards dissipation or a system will tend towards disorder or randomness. Um, and that is something we see in, over and over and over in living systems and energetic systems in general. If we, say, put a scoop of sugar in a glass of distilled water and we let it sit and we haven't saturated it with that scoop of sugar. Over time, because of this tendency for randomization, you'll see the sugar dissolve 
and dissociate itself evenly throughout the water. Um, and that might take a while because of uh, not mixing <laughs> very rapidly, except for the random molecular motion. But eventually, if you left it for a week, you'd have an evenly distributed uh, aqueous system of sugar and water. And that's really all we're getting to here is if you have an initial state of sugar dissolved in water and you slowly layer water on top and you let it sit, the sugar will dissociate evenly throughout the water. And you guys have heard of these terms used as diffusion and osmosis, I'm sure. So what's the difference between diffusion and osmosis? Well, osmosis is really just diffusion um, across a membrane in an aqueous system. So if osmosis is just a limited case of aqueous diffusion. And people tend to use them interchangeably, but they're not perfectly interchangeable. You can always just defer to diffusion if you're confused which one is appropriate. Oh, one last thing. Just like we can refer to um, enthalpy with a capital H, we refer to entropy with a capital S. Okay, so a couple examples of low and high entropy states, uh, just for a comparison, because these are some of the classic biochemistry questions you might be faced with. Um, which has higher entropy, liquid water at zero degrees that has yet to freeze, or ice? at zero degrees, which is already frozen. Um, in this case, obviously, the liquid water would have higher entropy because it has a higher state of randomization to its molecular motion uh, because it's liquid. And the ice, because it's solid, will have all of its water molecules in a frozen lattice, which is rigid um, and has extended hydrogen bonding, which we talked about in the last chapter. To extend that same analogy with water, we can compare liquid water to water vapor or boiled water. And um, even at the same temperature, the water in the gas state, because it no longer has hydrogen bonding to itself because of the distance between the molecules, uh, will have a much higher state of randomization to it than the liquid water will. So these are kind of just reminders, because I know you guys have already seen this at least once, probably twice, maybe even three times in your career, but let's just to keep everyone a little bit fresh on, on what the tools are that we have at our disposal for discussing thermodynamics. So let's talk about Gibbs free energy or free energy. Um, one of the things that we have to really wrap our heads around in this chapter is we're going to use thermodynamic terms to discuss whether or not a reaction tends to occur. And we can approach that purely from an enthalpy discussion. Is something favorable in terms of enthalpy? We can discuss it in terms of entropy. Is the entropy term contributing to something happening spontaneously or not? But really, to see the whole picture, we have to evaluate Gibbs free, Gibbs free energy, or just free energy. And I typically call it Gibbs free energy um, out of habit, but you can, are obviously welcome to use either. So let me just circle it here. This is the relationship between free energy of a system, the enthalpy, the temperature and absolute temperature, and the enthalpy. So you can see that the entropy term is combined with the absolute temperature. And this is really just it. And everyone should be pretty comfortable with this. I'm pretty sure everyone's used this before. But the change in Gibbs free energy of a system equals the change of enthalpy in the system minus the product of the absolute temperature times the change to the entropy of a system. Now, when we talk about delta or change in, Everyone needs to keep it fresh in their head that whenever you see delta, that means final 
minus initial state. That's always the case. Whenever you see a delta term, it's always referring to the final minus initial state. And what delta G really represents is the portion of total energy that's available to do useful work um, under constant temperature and pressure, which biological systems for the state, uh, for most common senses, particularly within cells, have for the duration of chemical reactions. So even approximately, we can let that ride as a definition. So one last time, delta G really is representative of the energy that's available to use for useful work, meaning chemical reactions or exerting work on a system or producing heat. So this is a neat little table that's in the book. And these are trends that you want to keep fresh in your head. So yes, you need to know that delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. But what really defines, the first thing you need to look for is the sign of delta G here. Is it positive? Is it minus? Is it zero? So first off, if delta G is negative, so let me spin this around here. What if delta G is negative? That means that there is actually available free energy to do work and that the chemical process which is being described is thermodynamically favorable. I like to refer to this as spontaneous. So I'll just put spontaneous. Well, what happens if delta G is zero? What that means is that there is no free energy to do new work, but there's no need to put work into the system to accomplish anything. So this is meaning that a reaction is in equilibrium. It's on the cusp of going one way or the other, and you can drive it via a variety of different mechanisms. And then lastly, what if it's positive? If the sign of delta G is positive, when you <laughs> take the difference of the enthalpy and the product of the temperature times the entropy, that means the process is thermodynamically unfavorable at that particular state. And that means that it is not a spontaneous process. Meaning to make this process take place, you would need to do work to it to accomplish that net. Okay, so let's see here. Moving moving along. So let's look at two simple examples of this, just to make it a little bit more lucid, perhaps. Let's ask this question. Is it energetically favorable for ice to melt at 263 Kelvin, which is minus 10 Celsius, where the delta H is plus 5,630 5, joules per mole, and the delta S is plus 20.6 joules per Kelvin mole. So in this particular circumstance, we can't judge which is more fav which is going to happen until we look just by looking at the enthalpy. We can't judge what's going to happen just by looking at the entropy. We have to see what's happening in the package. And now what's neat about this example is we all have a really nice intuition for what happens to water naturally at minus 10 C. So we have a nice double check on the system here. But let's go ahead and plug it in. If we take the 5,630 joules per mole and substitute it for our enthalpy, we put in 263 Kelvin and we put in 20.6 joules per Kelvin mole for our entropy, we see that our answer is a positive 212 joules per mole of Gibbs free energy. Now, because it's positive, right away, you know this is not a favorable reaction for ice 
to melt at this temperature. To make ice melt at this temperature requires a considerable, considerable input of energy to the system. So this will not happen spontaneously, it will stay frozen. Um, now, in a little bit, we'll talk about what the magnitude of this number means. But for now, let's just focus on positive negatives and zeros. So the next example, um, conversely, is it energetically favorable for ice to melt at 283 degrees Kelvin, which is plus 10 Celsius, where you have a delta H of 6,770 joules per mole and a delta S of 24.7 joules per Kelvin mole. And we do the exact same process where we can substitute our enthalpy term, our absolute temperature term, and our excuse me, our enthalpy term, our absolute temperature term, and our entropy term, and you'll see that we get a negative 220 joules per mole. So is it spontaneous or favorable energetically for ice to melt when it's above zero degrees Celsius? Absolutely. That's our nice double check. So um, when you have a negative term, that means the defined process is going to go off without a hitch, without the need for external energy. It will be favorable. It will be spontaneous. Uh, conversely, if it's positive, it will not be favorable. It will require the input of energy and it will be non-spontaneous. Let's see here. Oh, and here's yet another nice little way to visualize the interplay of how positive and negative enthalpy and entropy terms can play together to result in different um, outcomes. But I like this next slide more. So let's just go ahead and jump right to the next slide because it gives us a visualization of how not just sign but magnitude is variable of these terms. So here we can do an initial survey of our Gibbs free energy term and we can see right out the gate we have a negative 218 here, we've got a negative 1326 here, and we have a negative 30 here. All of these processes are negative delta G. They're all spontaneous slash favorable processes. They're not equally spontaneous. Ah, what do you mean by equally spontaneous? Well, technically they are all spontaneous, so in that regard they're equal, but their motivation to tend towards the product chemically will be less in this case than in this case because the degree of how negative it is is variable. So we can get there a variety of different ways. Even though these are all um, favorable exergonic processes, you can see that in this first case, let me grab a different color here, we have a negative term for our enthalpy. We have a negative term for our entropy as well. So everything is tending towards a favorable reaction, which is the outcome we see. However, in this second case, we have a very large negative enthalpy term but we do see a increase in entropy. So just because there's an increase in entropy, because we have a, um, let's see here, let's see, uh, increased degree of organization to the system, that doesn't mean inherently that the reaction won't happen spontaneously. We have to look at both of these variables together to see what happens with the Gibbs free energy term. And in this case, we see that it's still overwhelmingly negative and therefore is still highly favored. And if you look at the title, combustion of ethanol, we all know that with a little bit of spark, ethanol uh, in the absence of water to dilute it and reduce its vapor pressure is highly combustible. So that's a nice easy double check. Um, and then we can see over here on the far right on our example C, that we still have a slightly negative term for our Gibbs free energy. And this is achieved because even though we have an increase of enthalpy for the system, 
we have a very large decrease in entropy. And at that given temperature of this reaction, because that factors into the magnitude of that negative T delta S, we still have a favorable reaction. So whenever you're facing a question about whether or not a process is favorable, a process is spontaneous, whether or not a process requires external energy to proceed, you always need to evaluate the combination of both the enthalpy and entropy terms to determine whether or not your delta G is either negative, zero, or positive. That's always your go-to. Okay, so let's change gears a little bit. And uh, now that we've talked about uh, Gibbs free energy and we've alluded to the fact that we can define whether or not a system will progress forward or backward or maintain an equilibrium of state based on whether Gibbs free energy is negative, positive, or zero. Let's talk about equilibrium a little bit, and then we'll start to pull the Gibbs free energy term into our discussion of equilibrium. So let's see here if I can do a little drawing for you guys. So for any generic reaction, ooh, we have our reactants A, huh, wow, there we go, let me uh, fix that, there we are. So many moles of A plus so many moles of B are in a reversible reaction producing so many moles of C and so many moles of D. And what we need is a tool with which we can describe whether or not the reaction proceeds towards products, whether the reaction tends towards reactants, and to evaluate how much it does those two things. So what we have is we have this term K, our equilibrium term for any reaction. And what it is, is it's just looking at the ratio of products to reactants. That's all it is. People get this really messed up in their head without trying to figure out all the details. But really, we're just looking at the ratio of reactants adjusted for the number of moles and the ratio of product, uh, the ratio of products adjusted for moles and the ratio of reactants adjusted for moles. So K equals the concentration of C adjusted for the factor C, the concentration of product D adjusted for D, concentration of A to the A, and the concentration of B to B. So really, all we're doing, if we're looking at an equilibrium constant is reactants over here and products over here. So if you have a really large K value, or positive K value, that means that this term on top is larger than the term on the bottom, which means products are favored. And if you have a small k, that's because you have a larger reactant term than product term. And that means that the reactants are favored. So nothing too wild there. So another term we need to get comfortable with, and this is just a little twist on the same thing, is K is established at equilibrium. So this term K is defined for the concentration of C, D, A, and B respectively at equilibrium. So you say KEQ quite frequently. 
there's another term, the mass expression, Q, which is exactly the same thing. It's the concentration of C to C, concentration of D to D over your reactant expression A to A and B to B. But this is not at equilibrium inherently. I mean inherently because if Q is measured at equilibrium, it will equal K. But you can measure Q at any non-equilibrium state. You could see it at the beginning of a reaction, in the middle of a reaction. And then once the reactions we reached equilibrium, Q will equal K. But it's the same relationship that we're looking at just in a non-equilibrium condition. So those are things to keep straight, the difference between Q and K. Okay, let me erase this really fast, and we are going to move forward a little bit. I need some catchy music or something. Okay, and since we're going to be using the same reaction, I'm going to leave the reaction up. So we've already seen that delta G equals delta H minus T, delta S. So we've been introduced to the idea of Gibbs free energy. And we know that Gibbs free energy can tell us whether or not something proceeds spontaneously or not, or is in an equilibrium condition. Well, we know that an equilibrium constant can give us some of the same information. So we actually have combined term, which we should look at, where delta G equals delta G naught plus RT, natural log of C to D over A to B. And this, of course, is K, or Q, depending on what you look at. And if we want to use it the most generalizable way possible, we can say delta G naught plus RT ln Q. What this does is this gives us a snapshot of delta G as a function of delta G under standard conditions plus the function of R times T times our equilibrium expression. And you can see that the two are related now, where equilibrium is a function of delta G. And we're going to add one more thing to this before the end of the chapter. Um, and it's a little bit of an elaboration, but it's a worthwhile elaboration. So actually, let me move on to a different slide here. So let's see here. If whoop, at, at equilibrium, what's delta G again? It's 0. So if we go back to the previous expression and we say that we're going to happen at equilibrium, where Q equals K and delta G equals 0, we can substitute and say that delta G equals 0 and delta G naught plus RT ln K. And this is a really, really nice useful term. We can modify this by moving, uh, subtracting RT ln K from both sides. This is a more commonly way we see this relationship. And then we can even isolate K 
we have to get rid of the natural log by using uh, E. Negative delta G not over RT. There we go. So you can actually see functionally at any given temperature, because that's the only other variable in play here, that delta G and equilibrium are inextricably intertwined. So it's not just positive and negative. The magnitude of our delta G term, while being positive or negative, impacts K, which impacts whether or not the reactants are favored or the products are favored and to what extent the reactants and products are favored. So let's take a look at an example calculation using that last relationship that we went through. Um, this is a bit of a contrived example, but we'll work with it. So we have glucose 6-phosphate, or uh, G6P, and it's in equilibrium with fructose 6-phosphate, and this is one of our common steps of primary metabolism. And you can see delta G is close to zero, but not quite. It's a slightly positive term uh, for the con uh, version of glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate spontaneously. And to be fair, we shouldn't be that surprised because if you look at the sum of all of the bond energies, the six-membered ring and the glucose 6-phosphate is just marginally less strained than the five-membered ring, and we have a lot of flexibility with both structures. So in terms of total bond energies, they're nearly equivalent, and there isn't a significant uh, entropic factor associated with one being favored over the other. So it makes sense that these would be interchangeable or nearly interchangeable in terms of delta G. Now, if we substitute all of the relevant values, we have our delta G of uh, 1.7 kilojoules per mole. If we go for joules per mole, that's why we go to 1700 instead of 1.7. You can see, let's see, we've got 1,700 joules per mole here. We've got our constant R, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, and we are looking at this at 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin. And this provides an equilibrium constant of 0.5, which is not at equilibrium, but it's at a fairly close ratio to a... Um, equilibrium process. So let's see here, we got the other way to view this is that at equilibrium, the ratio of fructose 6-phosphate as our product, because this would be in substitution of the um, C to C, D to D over A, A, B, B term, same thing. Here we have our product here we have our reactant. So our ratio of product over reactant is going to be about 0.5, which means we have about a 1 to 2 ratio. So this is favored. Um, now here's the catch. Here's the catch. Everyone's thinking, okay, this is super easy. I've got this. This, if you take glucose 6-phosphate and you put it on a shelf, at 25 degrees Celsius, that temperature right there. You're going to wait for a very, 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 very long time before you have a 2 to 1 ratio of fructose 6-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate. Whether or not a reaction is favored does not mean it's a fast reaction. It means that when it reaches equilibrium, it will have this value. But it can take an enormous amount of time to reach that. Because we can look at this from our classic sense. We have our reaction progress and we have our level of reactants. And if we have a huge energetic barrier, but we have a slight difference between our reactants and products, Yes, because we have a lower trough where we're ending up in terms of our energy, 
this will be favored and we're going to end up more favoring our products than our reactants. But because of this huge energetic barrier, it's going to happen very, very, very slowly. So um, part of biology and biochemistry is manipulating these systems so that we have energetically, energetically favorable processes, but it's also about using chemical processes that have high barriers to activation so they don't happen without us controlling the process biologically. Uh, we want to get the best of both worlds in terms of control and efficiency. Okay, And this brings up another interesting point, talking about equilibrium a lot with K, and then we have the biological term homeostasis. The system um, stable state for ideal biological function. So both of these things involve relatively constant ratios of reactants and products. However, what is maintained under biological conditions are not necessarily the same things that happen at chemical equilibrium. In fact, oftentimes it's quite the opposite of that. They're very distant from chemical equilibrium. And it takes a lot of energy to maintain homeostatic conditions. And that seems counterintuitive because you wouldn't think that we would have to spend a lot of energy just to maintain our steady state if we're striving for biological efficiency. But as we get into this a little bit further, you'll see some of the mechanisms by which that is um, actually favorable. So let's talk about coupling of non-favorable reactions with favorable reactions. And this is really, really critical to biological function. We have a lot of reactions that take place that do not want to happen spontaneously, whether slowly or quickly. We want to join bonds together and we want to synthesize lipids. Synthesizing lipids takes an enormous amount of reductive energy. And we have to have systems which consume energy so we can utilize it to perform chemical reactions which are not favorable. This involves an actual physical coupling of reactions. So um, as a basic example, let's say you have a chemical process in which A is in equilibrium with B. And this is not favorable because under biological conditions, uh, delta G naught slash, you have a positive delta G. However, you have another chemical system taking place biologically, which C is in equilibrium with D, and that is a favorable process. If you couple the two processes together, where the two reactants join as part of the same reaction at the same location of reaction to produce B and D, we can still have a net negative delta G for the coupled reaction, and this can be energetically favorable. Now, we do this all the time in biology where we drive unfavorable chemical reactions using favorable reactions. So we consume high energy compounds such as ATP, for instance, to, and these are some really good examples, pump metabolites across membranes against concentration gradients. We spend an enormous amount of energy establishing concentrating concentration gradients in neurons in the mitochondria in the gut, especially the neurons. Because without a concentration gradient, we don't have neuronal firing. Um, hence, nerve impulses, actually contracting muscles, doing physical work with chemical reactions as part of our environment. And one of the classic examples of this is the coupling of the hydrolysis of phospholinylpyruvate, or PEP, which is extremely favorable, and we'll look into that in a little bit, and how that drives the phosphorylation event of adenosine diphosphate to the triphosphate form, forming ATP. So this is a non-favorable event, ATP being formed from ADP, PEP hydrolyzing to pyruvate, 
is very favorable. And we can couple these two processes at the same enzyme to make the process of forming ATP net favorable. This is something that you guys are going to have to wrap your head around just a little bit. I'm going to not put that much emphasis on it. I have some general questions about it in exams, but I'm not going to be busting your chops very hard on it. But you need to be aware of it. When you're looking at chemistry relationships from a Chem 106 perspective, everything's from standard state. And a lot of those standard states involve one molar concentrations. Well, it turns out and I don't think any of you are surprised at the stage in your education, that, as it says down here, many of our reactants, in this case, what they're referencing specifically are protons and water, are very far from one molar concentrations. So what um, happens in biochemistry all the time is you have to define standard conditions for biochemical reactions. And what you'll see is that the lower concentrations for a lot of these reactants and products, that's going to substantially change the outcome on your delta G calculation. So not being at one molar, because we're not, we don't have one molar hydrochloric acid in our stomach. Um, we, we couldn't survive that. Uh, but we do generate acidic conditions in our stomach at lower concentrations. So let's take a look and using this, uh, relationship with ATP in the presence of water, have a reversible reaction which hydrolyzes to ADP forming the phosphate and free proton. So in a biochemical standard state which is denoted with the delta G with the not and the little dash, you're going to see the proton concentration being that of a neutral solution, which is 10 to the minus seventh moles per liter. And the activity of water is defined by as just standard convention of one, um, even though it's 55.5, uh, if you're to evaluate the molarity of water in itself. But that's just the convention that they're using. And it's because everything is in water and we don't want to have to modify every term with the same term because you end up with the same effect as just using one anyway. So what we're doing here is modifying all of our product terms and all of our reactant terms with the actual values present. In this case, it's in water. So we're going to divide by one. In this case, divide by one this case, divide by one. For protons, we're dividing by the concentration of protons in solution of a neutral pH, which is 10 to the negative 7 moles per liter. And when we do that, instead of just working the math out by hand, because it's a little bit tedious to go through it, you can see a couple different effects. We can do all of our substitutions, uh, and even, let's go back to the beginning here. Let me see. So hydrolysis of ATP, pH of 7.4, 25 degrees Celsius, 5 millimolar, 0.1 millimolar, 35 millimolar, respectively, for the ATP, ADP, and phosphate byproduct. And then delta G naught for ATP hydrolysis is negative 32.2 kilojoules per mole. So if we substitute as appropriate and we do all of our adjustment factors, you can see that our actual outcome for delta G is negative 52.5 kilojoules per mole. Now what makes that particularly interesting is that the delta G for hydrolysis was defined under biological conditions as minus 32.2 kilojoules per mole. So by operating at these particular homeostatic conditions, we were able to make our delta G term substantially more favorable towards the generation of the product than it had been before. So a lot of homeostatic conditions are actually specifically tuned to optimizing these terms at non-standard conditions, which is why it's worth the investment of energy 
to maintain that homeostasis. All right, so moving on to ATP um, and other high energy compounds in the cell. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It's a nucleotide right here, coupled to a carbohydrate here, and it has three phosphate groups here. And it's really common to abbreviate a phosphate with just a P as part of the drawing procedure. So if you see A2P and you see three Ps, like you do in the textbook all the time, they're just referring to three phosphates. And when these are hydrolyzed, they're hydrolyzed from the outer position in. So this will be the first to go, this will be the second, and this will be the third. And when you lose the first one, you now have two phosphates and you now have a DP diphosphate. If you lose the second or blue one, you now have AMP monophosphate. A couple fun facts about ATP. Um, we don't have that much of it, but we use it a lot. And that involves recycling ATP from ADP very, very, very frequently. So it just ballpark, assuming that you have a 50% efficiency to uh, mm, store all of the food we eat. If we eat 11,700 kilojoules of food um, instead of going with the kilocalorie version, um, that means that we need to store or process about 5,860 kilojoules of energy in the form of ATP. And to do that, would require, if we didn't recycle ATP well, 65 kilograms of ATP per day. But what we actually have is about 50 grams. So that means that that 50 grams gets recycled about 13,000 times per day, just as part of our normal routine metabolism. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why we don't store energy as ATP, but we'll get into most of that when we hit the lipids chapter. Mostly, it would be terribly efficient. Think of carrying an extra 150-something pounds around just because we can't recycle a single phosphate quickly. So let's take a look at that phosphate event. Now, the hydrolysis, hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and then subsequently to AMP is really a story of phosphoric acid and hydrides. And those of you who are in OCHEM 2 or have had OCHEM 2 are thinking, hmm, anhydrides. There's, I seem to remember something about anhydrides. And you'd be correct. There's some unique chemistry in anhydrides which we're using to a biological advantage here. But let's just do a quick summary before we talk about that. You can have simple hydrolysis event where water attacks a phosphate, kicks off this bond here, creates a new double bond leading to housing a new charge, and that gives us our inorganic phosphate. This is highly favorable, negative 32.2 kilojoules per mole. And you can do it again, going from the diphosphate to the kicking off another inorganic phosphate, also favorable, minus 32.4 kilojoules per mole. In fact, equally, if not slightly more efficient. And then the monophosphate, still favorable, but not remotely as favorable as the first two. So, why is that? Well, phosphoric anhydrides are remarkably similar, chemically, to acetic anhydride. And if you remember from acetic anhydride, it's a classic case of an oxygen stuck between two doubly bound carbon oxygen systems that make it impossible for it to enter a resonant structure. So let's, let's talk about that. So typically, if you have, like in a carboxylate, something like this, you can have resonance where a pair of electrons will move here, pushing one of those pi systems up here, and you'll have a nice equilibrium system where the charge is now housed on the other oxygen equally as often 
as it was on the first oxygen, which is why we have to define any resonance structure as a summary of two things or three things simultaneously. Now, if we look at an acetic anhydride, if you do that, you can't push the electrons in both directions simultaneously. You create a non-favorably charged system when you do that. So the electrons can go one way, or the electrons can go the other way, but you can't be in resonance across both simultaneously, and the product of the resonance is not a particularly good resonance product. So in the end, when you hydrolyze the acetic anhydride, you now have two acetates that can effectively resonate. The product is highly favored because of the ability to form resonance products. So stabilization of products by resonance highly favors the product. Also, you see a lot of electrostatic repulsion possible with all of these lone pairs hanging out in close proximity to one another. That is resolved through hydrolysis. And then entropy is also increased when we have uh, multiple free compounds freed from a single larger compound. So that's a less important but also significant term. So using acetic anhydride as a model, you can see the exact same rationale in our phosphoric anhydride, which is what we are hydrolyzing from ATP to ADP. That's also why we have a high favorability here and here, but we have lower favorability for our third hydrolysis step when we are no longer looking at an anhydride model and we're just taking a phosphate off of a carbon. So we typically think of ATP as kind of our catch-all, go-to biological energy model. Um, but it's really just the most important intermediate shuttle for our management of our energy. It's not the highest energy compound in our system biologically, not even close. So if you're looking at ATP and ADP, they tuck in right there with a delta G of minus 32 and change. But if you're talking about primary metabolism, we have a couple that are significantly more favored. We have our hydrolysis of phospholinyl pyruvate to pyruvate and our 1,3-BPG to phosphoglycerate, the second one, are, are much, much, much more favored. So these are all favorable spontaneous events that are energy yielding, but ATP is not the big dog in the show. It's our shuttle. And this last sentence is really the key to it. It's only a transient energy carrier. Remember, this is getting recycled 1,300 times per day. It doesn't hang on to that phosphate for very long. It gets phosphorylated from ADP using higher energy systems, and then it's rapidly consumed. It doesn't hang around for very long. So it's really literally a shuttle of energy from one thing to another to join metabolism with more refined needs biologically. Now, I just showed everybody phosphorylated pyruvate, or PEP, and going back to it, you can see highly favorable, minus 61.9 kilojoules per mole. So why is PEP so much more favored than hydrolysis of ATP? Well, hydrolysis of PEP actually yields an enol form of pyruvate, and then the enol form tautomerizes to the keto form, and that enoketo tautomerization is extremely favorable. So that extra keto enol step that we see down here at the very bottom, starting here, is actually where that extra favorability is coming from. So we still have a hydrolysis step where we're kicking off the phosphate, but then we have to join 
this version of pyruvate to the biologically favored form of pyruvate, and that yields that extra 30, negative 33.6 kilojoules of stability, going from the enol form to the keto form. So if you can't quite remember your keto enol uh, tautomerization, probably worth just brushing up on it for a second. But, but I'm not going to quiz you on the mechanism of the keto enol tautomerization. You don't have to push the electrons for me. I'm not that mean. Okay. So I want to get everybody refocused again on energetic barriers and a couple different definitions that vary between the way we talk about high energy things in chemical systems versus biochemical systems. So once again, let's focus on the fact that just because you have a delta between your reactants energy level and your products energy level, and that that delta gives you a negative delta G, which means that it's favorable and that it's spontaneous, in this case, 30.5 kilojoules per mole, um, depending on the model you're reading, you still have a huge activation barrier. The transition state requires anywhere from 200 to 400 kilojoules of mole, uh, kilojoules per mole, to be overcome before it can roll downhill to your ADP. Now, that's why we have to talk about the differences in terms. When we talk about high energy in organic chemistry, high energy compounds are typically thought of as unstable because stability and low energy are inexorable, right? They're always intertwined when we're talking about organic chemical systems. Now, when we're talking about high energy compounds in biochemistry, typically we're not talking about things that are inherently unstable. In fact, all of our, quote, high energy compounds ATP, ADP, phosphoenolpyruvate, 1,3-BPG, all these things you could put out benchtop and they're not going to decompose rapidly. They're actually very stable. And that high stability is because of the amount of energy it takes to go through the transition state to go between one form and another. Now, those are separate definitions you have to reconcile in your toolkit, just depending on what you're discussing. If you're discussing organic chemistry with somebody and you say something's high energy, they will think reactive and not stable. If you talk about high energy compounds with a biochemist, they're going to be thinking can yield a lot of energy to be coupled to other non-favorable processes, but are not necessarily inherently unstable. So knowing your audience and knowing your topic, really important when you're throwing around the term high energy. So. Um, going back to, let me just erase this really fast, going back to why we like reactions, biologically speaking, in terms of our chemical rationale, that have high energetic barriers to activation. We don't want to have chemical reactions taking place in our biology that just go willy-nilly off on their own because we would have no control over them. Biology is about ruthless control over our energy. And if things are happening without our, mm, so say, in terms of our biological regulation, that makes efficiency very, very hard to achieve. Now, if you are using reactions like this one, where we have this really high energetic barrier to activation, but once it's achieved by coupling it with another reaction or reducing it via the use of an enzyme or both, we can benefit from the fact that it's a spontaneous reaction, but we can control it because it has such a high energetic barrier to activation. So like I said before, we want to have the best of both worlds. We want to have efficiency and we want to have control both of them at the same time, preferably. Now, that's really the end of the content from th this book. Not necessarily. They talk about uh, reductive potentials in terms of electrochemical cells, but I wanted to talk about it in terms of equilibrium. So I'm going to elaborate just a little bit on what the book does for the next mm, four slides, and then we'll be done. So 
reduction potentials and the calculation of free energy changes for redox reactions. Now, redox reactions, um, if we're talking about biological events, what is a redox reaction? Well, let's just talk about what is oxidation and what is reduction. So for those of you who don't know the term oil rig, You may laugh because most of you have probably heard this. I didn't learn about it until after my PhD when a student told me. I just had it wrote memorized um, because my teachers didn't you know, use things that made life easy. They punished us mercilessly for no reason. Um, oil rig is oxidation is loss of electrons. Rig Reduction is gain of electrons. So whenever you're talking about a redox reaction, you're talking about a reduction event in which electrons are being provided to an oxidation event. Now, for everyone who's been doing organic chemistry, and I know you have been because it's a prerequisite, and everybody loves organic chemistry because it's awesome, if you have any scenario in which a nucleophile, let's say, is attacking a carbonyl, and the electrons, in terms of source to sink, attack our partial positive charge, push the electrons up to our electro negative host, which can transiently house the negative charge, what we just did was a redox reaction. Anytime there is a transfer of electrons where something is losing electrons and something is gaining electrons, we have a redox couple. So biochemistry via organic chemistry is chock full of redox couples and redox chemistry. It's not all about electrochemical cells taking places in textbooks. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to talk about it. Because this typically gets swept under the rug, but it's going to become incredibly important in, o in biochem too, when we're looking at oxidative phosphorylation and oxidative respiration as part of metabolism, for instance. Uh, we're going to be looking a lot at this specific use of a redox couple. So, a couple definitions right out the gate. An oxidizing agent removes electrons and is reduced. A reducing agent receives electrons. And in virtue of receiving the exon, uh, receiving the electrons is oxidized. So, for any transfer of n number of electrons, the donor, which is reduced, becomes oxidized. And the oxidized system, which is the acceptor, becomes reduced. And it's just a little tricky to keep in your head. But think about oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. If the electron is leaving the reduced donor, oxidation is lost. Therefore, the reduced donor of the electron is oxidized. When that electron leaves that donor and goes to the oxidized receptor, that acceptor, which had been oxidized, is now gaining the electron. Therefore, it is now reduced. So we're always talking about half reactions. One half reaction, the electron is coming from it. One half reaction, the electron is being absorbed by it. And this is where it gets super fun. Because delta G is coming back with a vengeance, but it's encoupled with a new term. So. The reduction potential is this fun E, capital E, that's 
hard to draw. You know, looks kind of silly. But we're going to work with it. And the change in reduction potential is directly correlated to Faraday's constant times the number of electrons transferred. And that equals the delta G for the system. So I want you guys to think about this for a second. What does delta G mean? We've been looking at delta G as a term which allows us to evaluate how spontaneous or favorable a reaction is. Well, if a reaction is defined by, say, some nucleophile attacking a carbonyl, if this is a redox process we're discussing, the transfer of the electron to form the new bond is what we're looking at. And if we want to know how favorable that transfer is, we should be able to evaluate it in terms of delta G. But we can also directly say, in that acceptor-donor relationship, how favored is it based on reduction potential. So in essence, reduction potential or the change in reduction potential in a redox couple is kind of a motive force for the transfer of electrons in a chemical reaction. And that defines whether or not a reaction will be spontaneous or at equilibrium or non-spontaneous, favored or at equilibrium or unfavored. So I know it's a lot of stuff rattling around, and you guys can by virtue of technology, digest it in chunks if you need to. But I want everyone to maintain the relationship between delta G, K, and redox potential. It's just three different ways of looking at the same phenomenon, which is how favorable or non-favorable a reaction is, and to what extent that reaction will tend towards either the products or reactants. These are just tools in our toolbox that we can use to evaluate biochemical systems. So, that said, um, it's you have to remember when you're evaluating uh, the change in your uh, reduction potential that the first term is the acceptor and it's always the acceptor minus the donor and the way that I like to do that is whenever you're thinking Delta remember it's always final state minus initial state and when I think of it as final minus initial I think of the acceptor as where things end and so that would be your final state where it is the electron rests where it's accepted and the initial state being the donor so that helps me keep these things straight in my head so redox couples whenever you have a redox couple which has a large positive redox potential what that means so let's see here a large positive redox potential is that they tend to accept electrons and that makes sense because reduction is inherently the gain of electrons. So if something has a large positive potential to happen, that means it really wants to accept those electrons. Likewise, the redox co uh, couples which have large negative redox potentials tend to donate electrons because remember this is a redox or uh, reduction potential. And if the redu reduction potential is negative, that means it doesn't want to accept the electrons. It would much rather donate the electrons. So just keeping these things straight in your head lets you do those relatively easy calculations uh, without getting confused. And this is the last slide. It's from the book, um, and I thought it was useful because we could look at a couple examples of whoop, large reduction potentials and negative reduction potentials. So for the half reaction as written, going from the oxidant to the donor, because that's how it's laid out in this direction, for the half reaction, a half of molecular oxygen plus two protons plus two electrons want to become water, 
Yes, that reaction wants to take place because as written, it's very favorable for these electrons to move from this state to this state. Reduction is gain. So conversely, if you have a negative value like this, not so much. Now the fun thing about these charts is this is always evaluated into as written. But if we were to evaluate this half reaction drawn in this direction, the magnitude would be the same, but it would be a different sign. It would be plus 0.421 volts of potential if we were evaluating the opposite direction of the same half reaction. Same for down here. If we were to look at going from water towards its components, we would be looking at a negative 0.815 volts. So um, you always have to, you know, occasionally when you're doing half reaction questions, mm, you have to reverse your sign um, to, to get the appropriate half reaction because they're only going to list it one way. They're going to assume you know to reverse it the other way and change the sign. So that is my second lecture, about three minutes shorter than the first lecture. Um, and I hope you guys all had a nice holiday on Monday and did a little casual reading and relaxed and are ready to rock and roll and get into this last this next chapter. So I'll be posting another video hopefully by the end of the week for chapter four. And then we'll have a little bit of review time before the first exam. So I'll talk to everybody later and bye-bye.